All right, so again, welcome once more. My name is Liz Reed for the Moore Memorial Library, and tonight's program is hosted by Together Yes and Progress No Road in the Library, and we are very pleased to have with us tonight Ian Cook from the Neponset River Watershed Association. I'm going to share my screen over to uh, Susan for a quick introduction, so bear with us as we jump behind the curtain and you get to see the scene change. Okay, Susan. Good evening, thank you for coming. It's very exciting that we are finding a way to make this sustainability series happen. Uh, great thanks to Neponset River Watershed Association and Ian Cook and great thanks to Norwood Library. Um, just a note before we begin, Together Yes, from the beginning of this series has had the policy that we will not discuss whether climate change is happening. That is a waste of time. Look out the window, uh, drive by the hospital we used to have. Uh, or watch the news. So we don't discuss that. What we do discuss is what we might expect and what we need to do to slow its acceleration. And it is shown to be accelerating. So this is an important talk and I'm, I'm grateful that Ian will come and join us for that. I'd also like to give you a quick hello from Kate Sibbing Dunn who is the director of Progress Norwood, which co-sponsors the sustainability series now. Thank you. Over Hi, to everybody. you, Kate. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for coming tonight and thanks to Ian for making the time. It's such a strange time for our community these days and um, especially for to think of, to be thinking about things that are concerning, right? There's sort of, it's sort of everywhere we turn. So I think it's really important and valuable for us to um, be conscious of and not necessarily take our eye off the ball when it comes to climate change because we're overwhelmed with other issues. Um, we do need to stop and take breaks and take time for ourselves, um, but we're, we're glad to be focused on this. Katie Neil Rizzo is also on the call and she leads up our green team. I just wanted to briefly tell you that if you're interested in finding out more about what Progress Norwood does um, with our green team or with our other teams, uh, you can find us at progressnorwood.org or you can email, email us at progressnorwood at e uh, gmail.com. So thank you again to the library and Ian and um, that's about it, thanks. Great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Ian can take it away. Hi. Let's see here. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, everybody, for having me. Let's see if we can just get that started there. All right. Um, so again, my name's Ian Cook. Can everybody hear me okay? Or is it better if I, I hold my microphone up higher? Is that better? I'll, no, nobody responded, so I'll take your word for it. Um, so uh, my name is Ian Cook. I'm the executive director of the Neponset River Watershed Association, and we are a, a regional nonprofit organization that works in Norwood and 14 other communities. We've been around um, for a long time now, since 1967, and our focus has traditionally been on trying to restore fishable, swimmable water quality, uh, trying to um, protect uh, open space and natural areas and trying to uh, improve conditions for local wildlife. But, but increasingly, our organization is focusing on uh, climate resilience issues. Uh, and I think, you know, over time, this is going to become uh, an issue that, that we're all very conversant with. And I, I like to start with this picture because, of course, you know, this, this is an issue of, of global warming. It's an issue that has been around for really a very long time, you know, arguably 50, some would say even 100 years, we've been aware of this um, potential problem. And for a long time, it's felt um, very distant. Um, you know, the, the notion of, you know, it would be nice if it was a little warmer. And, and you sort of hear some of the scientific information talking about, oh, a two degree increase in the temperature. It sounds vaguely pleasant. 
Um, but I think there is a growing awareness uh, of how serious a problem this is. And hopefully there will be um, over the next few years, a growing uh, political uh, commitment to beginning to deal with it in a, in a more substantial way. Um, so that's the global picture. But of course, we are not a global organization. We're an organization focused on the Neponset watershed. And so these are basically uh, 14 cities and towns where basically the, the rain falls in this yellow area and ends up uh, in the Neponset River and ultimately discharged to Boston Harbor. So about 330,000 people live in this watershed. About 120,000 people get some or all of their drinking water from uh, groundwater sources in the watershed. Uh, we have um, many businesses, lots of open space, many, many streams. And Norwood, of course, gets a gold star for being the only community that is entirely inside the Neponsa watershed. Um, so when we talk about global warming, we know that uh, there's warming right in there. So we know things are going to get hotter. Um, and I think for many years, we've all been hearing about these very large scale sort of global climate models and what's going to happen to uh, global average temperatures over the years. Um, and there's been, historically, there's been a lot of debate about that, but it, it seems to be that people are more and more um, convinced that this is actually happening and is, is actually a serious problem. And the, and the statistics bear that out. We've had, according to NOAA, we have had 43 years in a row of above average annual temperatures. And we've had 40, 435 months in a row of above average monthly temperatures. 2019 was the second hottest year NOAA had ever recorded on the planet. And the five hottest years uh, on record have happened since 2015. And I think increasingly people can just feel some of the change that's happening. And I think that that accounts for some of the thinking. The other thing that's happened is the science has started to evolve from having a very global picture to starting to have what are called downscaled climate models, where we can really start to look more specifically at what is actually going to happen, uh, you know, in Norwood, not merely across the globe. And, and what does you know, the notion of a, a two degree temperature change sounds not too, too dramatic, but in fact, the way that plays out on the ground really is uh, pretty significant. So this slide is just show, just to put it in context, this slide is showing um, NOAA's uh, estimate of the actual and projected number of days per year above 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Norwood. And on the left side of this graph, you can see the historic record. So the, the dark gray bars are the actual number of 90 plus degree days uh, per year since from 1950 to uh, 2005, I believe it is. And then the gray area is sort of the, the model run backwards to uh, kind of show the range of expected values. So really over that time, you know, we expected, you know, an average of seven or eight days a year of higher than 90 degree weather. As you move into the right, you start to see the projection of what we're looking forward to in the future. Um, and it, it takes a little bit to understand this graph. So the, the dark blue line in the center um, is sort of the, the average uh, number of days we would have in a year. And you can see that average increasing you know, by the time you get out to the end of the century, pushing up towards, you know, 25, 30, maybe even more days a year of 90 degree plus weather. But the thing to understand is that just like um, the gray is on the left is kind of the, the light gray is kind of the range of expected variability for temperature. The blue is the expected range of variability in the future. So by the time you get out to you know, 2060, 2070, they're likely to be some years where we've got 65 days a year over 90 degrees or 70 days a year over 90 degrees. And the challenge here is that this also is very dependent on what happens with future uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. How seriously do governments around the world and, and here in the United States take this challenge and, and how uh, do we uh, decide to change our ways 
to address this problem. So um, with, oops, all right. So with that temperature change, aside from it just being hotter, a lot of other things are gonna change. And one of the biggest things that's gonna change is weather. You know, we all sort of learned the water cycle in school when we were kids. And, you know, rain, rain falls, it goes into the ocean, it evaporates uh, and then comes back down as rain or snow or what have you. And one of the challenges with a hotter world is that more heat means more evaporation and more moisture in the air. And in fact, already we've been seeing the average amount of rain we get in a year has increased uh, significantly, like three, four inches, maybe more. And that's just measured, not, uh, not future. Um, you know, scientists and, and others have looked at this, and this is just a map showing across the country uh, how the frequency of heavy rain events has changed uh, during the last uh, 50 years or so. And uh, the Northeast is actually the area that's seen the biggest shift here. So we're getting, we're getting more rain, but we're not really getting more days of rain a year. We're just getting more larger rain events. So instead of uh, you know, a lot of sort of light sprinkles, we're getting more heavy downpours. And we've seen that huge 71% increase in those heavy rain events here in the Northeast already. And that's a trend that is um, definitely going to be continuing uh, as we go forward. Um, and then, the other thing to understand is that, so that, that's the, when I say heavy rain events on that previous chart, that's the sort of normal sized rain events. The other thing that has been happening in the Northeast is we've seen a really dramatic shift in the large rain events. You know, we used to um, talk about a so-called 10 year storm, the amount of rain that would typically fall during 24 hours, on average about once every 10 years, about a 10% chance of happening each year or a 25 year storm or a hundred year storm. Um, and those numbers, you know, the, the actual values from the, the 70s to 2000 are on the left of this chart. So, you know, that about once every 10 years, we would get a five inch rainfall over 24 hours. And about once every uh, hundred years, we would get a, uh, um, you know, maybe at eight, eight inch rainfall. Um, and you can see over time, these numbers are shifting dramatically. So, you know, what used to, what we used to think of as a 10 year storm is very rapidly becoming uh, a 50 year storm. So, you know, instead of getting uh, five and four, four and a half inches of rain once every 10 years, we're now talking about getting six inches of rain every 10 years. Um, and the hundred year figure is, is uh, really stepping up from, you know, eight inches to 11 and a half or 12 inches. Um, and that, is really generating um, a lot more frequent severe flooding and certainly probably better than anyone else in the area, Norwood uh, understands this problem right now. You know, Norwood this summer experienced a, a really a very extraordinary event, you know, four or five inches of rain in about 90 minutes. You know, it was a very, it occurred over a very small geographic area. It really overwhelmed downtown Norwood Interestingly, because it was so short and so intense and so localized, it didn't cause a big flood in the Neponset River because it, it wasn't that much total water. It just fell on so, so fast on such a small spot that it really um, overwhelmed the town, certainly overwhelmed the hospital. I'm sure by now everybody's seen this picture, which is just an amazing picture of the doors inside the hospital uh, giving way to those floodwaters. So those are the kinds of events we're going to be seeing um, more of, and we're going to frankly be seeing a lot more damage from those sorts of events. Um, the ironic flip side is that we are also going to be experiencing more drought. So we're getting more rain overall, more big floods, but we're also going to have more periods of drought. It's um, definitely sort of an ironic twist. And it, it's really because a lot of what climate change is doing is it's driving extremes. It's, it's you know, the average uh, changes a little bit, but the, the range of situations you expect changes a lot. And of course, this summer, ironically, Norwood got flooded, but Norwood also experienced a drought, which the state has um, identified as a so-called extreme drought. 
We've seen uh, the Neponsa River very, very dry. We've all heard a lot about um, extraordinary forest fires in the Western US. I think there's not been very much coverage of the fact that there, it's actually been a pretty significant fire season here in Massachusetts. There've been almost a thousand uh, forest fires in Massachusetts. Most of them are obviously a lot smaller um, than what's happening out West, um, but we're, we're not immune to that problem either. And it's also for, for the Neponset River, that's expressed as very low stream flow. This is actually a picture of the Neponset River uh, in Norwood, right near, um, just downstream of Route 1, uh, near the staples on Route 1, if you know where that is. And if you're not used to looking at the river, uh, it's a little hard to tell what's going on here, but uh, really the river is only about 12 feet wide and six inches deep. Uh, which makes it uh, not so great for recreation, creates some real challenges with water quality. Certainly it's very hard on wildlife. Normally the river would be filling the, uh, the whole riverbed area to that sort of green vegetation. And of course in the spring, it would be up and over that green vegetation and actually extending off the left side of the, uh, of the screen. It's not so much a problem, a direct problem in Norwood, but another big impact of climate change, which relates to, to heat and water, is sea level rise. Um, and there are various projections for what's going to happen with sea level. The, the more optimistic projections are for something like two and a half feet of sea level rise um, by the end of the century. And then if emissions are higher, those figures go significantly higher to up towards, you know, seven feet, or in this estimate, at least, this is the city of Boston's estimate that they're using for planning, up to maybe 10 or 11 feet. Um, and if you followed uh, some of the recent science about sea level rise, you know, some of the things that they're discovering about glaciers and, and warm water underneath glaciers, um, there's real concern that, um, that uh, some of the estimates around sea level rise may be too cautious on the part of uh, scientists at this point. And while that's not directly, you know, I don't think the sea level is going to get so high that you're going to have uh, salt water washing into Norwood anytime soon. But it does raise uh, all kinds of interesting questions in terms of, you know, the engine of our regional economy sits uh, right on the, on the ocean in the city of Boston. And as that's impacted, that will undoubtedly have other kinds of side effects on the town of uh, Norwood. This is just an example on the Neponset River. This is actually in Quincy. A couple of years ago, we had a, um, an unusually high spring tide combined with a coastal storm back in January. This is actually behind the Adams Inn near um, Route 3A, if anybody knows that area. We got here to take this picture probably after the water had come down a foot from its peak. And certainly not as dramatic as the, the freshwater flooding event that happened um, in Norwood this summer. But you know the owners of these cars are not very happy. The owners of the Adams Inn is not very happy. And the prediction is for events of this magnitude to be happening very regularly, multiple times a year. Um, as we get 50 plus years out into the future. So, you know, those are some of the changes that we're going to expect locally. And what, what's so, why does it matter? Um, one is that all of these changes are going to have really significant effects on human health. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the number one most deadly kind of natural disaster we have in the United States, it's not floods, it's not hurricanes, it's not tornadoes, and assuming we don't treat pandemics as a, as a natural disaster, which I suppose arguably they are, but the number one is heat. About 12,000 people a year get killed by heat waves. Um, heat can be very hard on the elderly, on the young, on people who uh, are outside, working outside. It, it is definitely an aggregating factor for heart failure, it aggregates, aggravates air pollution and affects people with res respiratory problems. For people who have to work outdoors in very high temperatures, there's an increasing problem with uh, ki kidney failure due to chronic dehydration. And of course, this heat does actually help to stimulate some of the um, 
potential infectious kinds of issues that we've seen like Tripoli and West Nile and, and, um, and uh, Lyme disease. So definitely a challenge in terms of public health and, and mortality. Um, and it's also important to bear in mind that very much like the current pandemic, the burden of some of these health issues is, is not equally distributed across society. You know, on the, on the right is sort of a, a picture of a stereotypical leafy green suburb. And on the left is a, a more urban environment. And you can just, just from looking at the picture, you can see on the left, we've got lots of pavement, no trees, uh, highways, infrastructure. And you can, you can just see that it's gonna be hotter there. And in fact, some recent studies have been showing really interesting patterns that show that in um, low income and minority neighborhoods that were subjected to redlining by the federal government back in the 30s, you can trace the redlining maps to modern day heat maps of the urban heat island effect. And in the city of Boston, um, there's an average of, I believe it's six degrees, the sum summer high temperatures are an average of six degrees hotter in underserved minority neighborhoods, low-income minority neighborhoods that were redlined in the 1930s as compared to more affluent neighborhoods in the, sit in the city. And when you start thinking about, you know, each degree of additional heat has additional mortality and economic cost issues, um, especially for people who don't have the ability to, you know, uh, make sure their house is better insulated. They may not have air conditioning. If they have air conditioning, they may not have enough money to run it. Um, as much as they need to. It can be a real, a real challenge for those vulnerable um, populations. And, and the equity issues get even more stark when you start thinking about them on a global scale. You know, one, half of the emissions um, around the world, is, well, let, me, let me restate that. The top 1% of most wealthy people around the world have, have released twice as many emissions as the lowest 50%. Um, and many of the people around the world um, are much more exposed to the consequences of warming that's, that's already happening, happening and that is coming. Of course, you know, our focus as an organization has traditionally been on a healthy river. Um, and all of these changes, both to water patterns and to heat are gonna pose big challenges for the river and for our ecology and our local wildlife. You know, we're going to be seeing um, significant changes to the plants and trees that survive uh, in our area. We're also going to be seeing, and we're already seeing, significant challenges with uh, worsened water pollution due to high temperatures and low stream flows during drought. And one of the things we've been focusing on recently is uh, trying to protect habitat for native um, brook trout that are actually uh, quite, um, that are much more populous in the Neponset watershed than almost any place else uh, inside 495. And in fact, some of those trout uh, are right in uh, Trap Hole Brook um, in Norwood. The, the picture in the bottom right, of course, is one of these, uh, one of these native trout. And these are a, sort of a keystone species in our streams, uh, but they are very sensitive to temperature and these increasing temperatures are gonna challenge uh, their ability uh, to survive. And then, you know, last but not least, if you don't care about public health and you don't care about um, wildlife, uh, there, there is or still more reasons to care about climate change, which is climate change is really expensive. It's really going to, um, strain our economy. Um, it's going to reduce agricultural productivity. It's going to um, uh, reduce just general productivity. It's going to lead to lots of infrastructure damage that has to be dealt with. And part of why I like this picture, this is obviously downtown Boston. The thing you can, I mentioned sea level rise, you know, that you can see the ocean there right, right behind Boston. Boston is a city that is not very high above the sea. And um, you know, as climate change affects Boston, that is gonna have all kinds of ripple effects to the economy in, in Norwood, to land use, uh, in, in inland areas, um, all kinds of uh, economic challenges. 
So uh, we have lots of problems. And the question is, what do we what do we do about it? So I just wanted to bring you back to this temperature map. Really, and I think this really illustrates um, one of the most important things we need to do. This, this version of that map has overlaid on it not merely the lower emission scenario we looked at before, which was the blue, but a higher emission scenario. This, is, is, this essentially is assuming that humanity continues uh, emitting more or less kind of business as usual. And while the prospect of living in uh, the Neponsa Valley when there's 35 days a year over 90 degrees isn't very appealing, the prospect of doing that when there's an average of 65 or 70 days over 90 degrees a year, um, and sometimes you might have as many as you know 100 or 105 days in a year over 90 degrees, it's really almost unimaginable. Um, so the first thing we need to do about this is we need to change the trajectory of our emissions. Um, climate change, uh, if we change the trajectory, climate change is going to be challenging. There's, there's no way at this point that there is not going to be a substantial amount of additional climate change that creates substantial challenges. But if we don't bend that emissions curve, uh, we're looking at situations that are um, going to be extremely difficult for communities to adapt to with, with tremendous costs and impacts to uh, the things we all care about. And I think, you know, one other thing that, that I think is important about this, this graph is we also have to remember that, that time is not on our side. I mean, we have been debating whether we should do something about climate change for, you know, at, at least 30 years very actively. And we, and, you know, as a society, frankly, we haven't done much. Um, looking forward, you know, 30 years from now, which is not really very long when you think about it. You know, I, I, I'm not, there's not a guarantee I'll be here, but I, I hope I'll still be here in 2050. Um, you know, so this is during my lifetime. We're going to be starting to see um, impacts that, that we will look back on uh, the rainstorms of, uh, of 2020 and think that was the good old days. And I happen to have a 17 year old daughter and I, I look at this graph and I think, you know, this is, this is her whole life um, that she is gonna be dealing with these challenges. So, that, so they're not, they're, th these issues are no longer far away in the future. So how do we do that? Certainly there are, all lots, all, there are lots of things we can do on an individual basis to try to reduce emissions in our own lives. I think it's a good thing to do that I think it helps to uh, set the pace for people in other places and prove that it can be done without having to um, give up a high quality of life. But there is also truth that um, you know individual actions are not sufficient to bend that curve. We really need to see very strong leadership um, at the state level and at the and particularly at the federal level to begin addressing um, the emissions issues and, and ultimately at the global level, of course. So the, the main thing I always urge people to do is when you're thinking about voting, make climate change and the considerations around climate change a significant consideration in how you decide to vote, whoever that is for. And I think this is an issue that, that I'm hoping is uh, increasingly not going to be a partisan issue because um, you know, the impacts of this uh, are not going to fall only on uh, red states or blue states. It's going to impact all of us equally. So the next thing, the next set of things, I think there is more uh, that we can do uh, at a local level to address. So one of the big challenges with the water aspect and, and some of the heat aspects of climate change is the way we've built our communities. And this is just a little aerial photo of, uh, I think this is maybe the Westwood Station area, I'm not sure. Um, but you can sort of see, you know, how much we have modified the landscape, how much uh, pavement we have created, how many areas we have created that are open pavement with no trees that do two things. One, they heat up 
and two, they cause water to run off where water used to soak into the ground and now rushes off uh, very quickly. And it has to get to what's left of the Neponsa River, which is kind of running through uh, the middle of the photo there. Um, and of course, you know, when it runs off streets, it has to get into one of these. These are storm drains. These, you will find these undoubtedly in, in your neighborhood. They're, they're all over the Neponsa watershed. And they are basically inlets to the storm drain system that allow uh, water that can't soak into the street to be carried away uh, by a pipe. One of the, th I think, strongest lessons of the rainstorms in Norwood is that it is almost impossible to contemplate designing a storm drainage system like this, a series of, of street inlets like this, that would be able, that would have been able to take in all the rain that fell on Norwood. Um, you know, so one, one of the, the real challenges here, and I, and I mentioned that, you know, the, the flooding in Norwood, it was really a failure of the capacity of the storm drain system. It didn't really overwhelm the river because it was so small and short and concentrated, but it really did overwhelm the town's storm drain system. Um, and of course, those storm drains lead through a pipe uh, very quickly to a place like this. This is a storm drain outfall. And there are, uh, there are tens of thousands, maybe, maybe even 100,000 storm drain inlets across the Neponsa watershed in our 14 communities. And there's on the order of maybe 3,000 of these storm drain outfalls, places where pipes take that water off the street, uh, whisk it very quickly to the pipe and discharge it with no um, water quality treatment. One of the big things we're focused on and we're urging all of our communities to work on is to rethink those storm drain systems. So to get away from that idea that, hey, the solution for all this water that can't soak into the ground anymore is just to send it to one of those storm drain inlets and shoot it off to the river as fast as possible. And there's a whole set of um, techniques now that are generally referred to green infrastructure techniques or storm water management techniques where instead of having that very hard piped kind of fast acting system uh, that's inevitably going to get overwhelmed in a large storm, you try to find ways to build in uh, green features, places where you can send the water and temporarily hold it while it gets filtered through plants and soil and let it slow down before you try to push it into the storm drain system. Um, and there's various ways you can do this. If you have a lot of space, you can do something like the previous picture, but even in very densely built areas, we can rethink the way we are designing our communities to use features like you know, a row of trees by the sidewalk to both uh, reduce our urban heat, heat island effect and to capture and slow down and clean up that water. You know, And one of the, the observations here is in um, the storm event, that Norwood had, you know, wouldn't it have been nice if we had uh, designed features throughout downtown town Norwood to make downtown Norwood greener, and that might have been able to hold back an inch of the four or five inches of rain that fell. Now that wouldn't completely solve the problem, but it would have allowed the, the engineered storm drain system to work much better if we could reduce the amount of water we were sending to it by 25% in that storm. Um, and then of course, you know, the other challenge with, with all of these practices is education and the process of uh, trying to change people's expectations about what an urban streetscape looks like and how it works and getting away from the traditional approach, which says that the solution to uh, runoff from pavement is just to get rid of it as quickly as possible. The other thing we really need to do is towns have uh, tremendous authority over the way their communities are built. In Massachusetts, towns are really the ones who regulate um, the design of private development. And most of the pavement in our communities, about 60% or more on average, is not owned by the town or by Mass Highway. It's owned by private parties. And we really need cities and towns to be uh, more aggressive in the way they 
uh, ask developers to design their sites. You know, on the left here is a classic sort of big box uh, retail situation, you know, not a tree in sight. All the water is coming off this parking lot very quickly. And on the right is a different approach. You know, we could have trees in the parking lot to give us shade to slow down the water. So towns really need to be thinking hard about looking at their, their zoning, their stormwater, their subdivision bylaws, and rethinking them in terms of um, climate change issues. Another issue is, you know, we talked about how the big storms have gotten bigger. Um, and one of the other things that we regulate in Massachusetts is we, is we regulate development in the floodplain. And the floodplain is basically just the area along the sides of the river or along the sides of wetlands that uh, accumulates water and, and floods during a flood. And this, this chart is showing in, um, in South Norwood. Um, in the pink is showing uh, the 100 year floodplain, which was mapped based on the, um, the rainfall data from the 1960s, so outdated rainfall data. So this is the area that we, we thought used to flood um, and it, which is regulated. So building is regulated inside that was quote unquote 100, 100 year floodplain area, even though we know it's, a, it's an outdated, it's based on outdated rainfall. The 500 year floodplain is we know now, given that we have more rain in the area that's gonna flood and the 500 year floodplain is not regulated. Um, so another kind of change we need to have in terms of how we're thinking about regulating development and redevelopment in our communities. Water use is another big challenge. You know, Norwood is um, unusual. Most of the towns in the upper part of the Neponset watershed get their drinking from water from local sources. That means, you know, in effect, they're sort of competing for the same water that the river needs to keep flowing during the summer. Um, Norwood uh, gets its drinking water from the MDRA system, which is probably the most uh, robust potential source of drinking water available. You could, you could uh, the MDRA system and the storage they have is large enough that um, it could withstand a five-year drought before they ran out of water. Um, but in many communities, the way we're using water, you know, keeping enormous lawns um, green, uh, for our convenience, uh, there really is not enough uh, water in a, a world of uh, climate change for us to have both uh, rivers that can function and support recreation and fish, and also some of the landscaping practices we've become accustomed to and some of the choices about how we use water and, and where we source our water from. So that's an area not so much for Norwood, but that many other communities really need to be thinking about and, and it does influence you know the river the river that people from Norwood will see passing through their town even though Norwood is is not directly affecting it. Another big challenge that comes with development is sort of stringing the area along streams you know in protecting those trout one of the most important things we need to do is keep our rivers cold um, and a natural stream you've got trees and lots of shade in many places in the watershed, we've allowed development and landscaping right up to the edge of the river. We really need to reestablish that shade, what's called the riparian habitat, uh, if we hope to have uh, wildlife be able to continue to survive in our streams as things get hotter. Protecting floodplains. You know, as I mentioned before, floodplains are the places where the water goes to sit once it's flooded. Um, they're also very important wildlife habitats. There's a lot of places where we've built things in the floodplain that we probably shouldn't have. These are usually things that end up flooding a lot because they're built in the floodplain. Um, and we're really gonna need more floodplain space in the future to help hold on to and slow down those things. So, so protecting floodplains, and even in some cases, trying to restore floodplains, pull uh, you know, historical development back out of the floodplains is something we need to think about. Another big infrastructure challenge is dams. And this one is definitely a challenge in Norwood. Um, you know, many people think of dams as being flood control measures, um, but there are about a hundred dams on the Neponset and its tributaries. And only two of them are actually intentional flood control dams. Most of them are remnants of uh, the industrial area. 
and they become a obstacle that floodwaters must get over uh, when they start to come. And, and the real danger with dams is in fact that during a flood, the dam will fail because it's overwhelmed by the flood and then all the water stored in the pond behind will be suddenly released. There's also tremendous ecological benefits of removing some of our unneeded dams to allow things like those native trout that want to be able to move up and downstream and get blocked by, uh, by dams. So a big issue there and, and a number of significant safety issues in, um, in Norwood with uh, large dams that don't have the capacity to pass these increasingly large floods. Similar to dams, every time a road crosses a stream, there's a pipe that carries uh, the stream uh, under the road. In many cases, those pipes were, were not designed to handle even today's uh, storm flows. And this is a, an example of a pipe that just got washed away by the stream during a flood, which is obviously bad for the stream. Um, these are another challenge for aquatic life in the, in the uh, river because they sort of break up the river and fish can't move upstream and downstream where they need to. But also you could imagine if you were having an emergency and the hospital was on the other side of this culvert, it would be a big problem that it wasn't there anymore. So looking at our culverts and upgrading those, another big challenge. And then the last thing I'll mention is, you know, I had alluded to things um, that have probably been built in places where they shouldn't have been built that are going to be under greater and greater flood threat as time goes on. And, and this is a, a map of the, uh, the Neponset River estuary downstream. Dorchester's on the left, Quincy's on the right. Um, the river's obviously coming up through the middle. And this is Ma the Mass Highway Department's uh, estimate uh, going out to 2070 of areas that are gonna be flooded. And the thing I wanna point out is, is this, I think you can see my pointer, is this building here. This is a very large building that is gonna be completely underwater uh, once a year or once every other year, 50 years from now. Not only is it completely underwater, but it, it's gonna be completely on an island because all the roads approaching it are gonna be completely underwater. And it begs the question with some of these um, things that are built in very vulnerable locations, does it make sense for society to invest tremendous amounts of money to uh, armor those areas and build huge seawalls? Um, or are there some places we simply are going to need to pull back from um, and frankly restore to their historical condition. This, this particular spot used to be a salt marsh. Um, and usually when you build something in a salt marsh, it's, it's gonna be flooded. Um, so last but not least, in terms of specific things in Norwood, there are some specific things coming up that Norwood is, is looking at doing that we would urge everybody to support. One is at town meeting this fall, uh, Norwood has a study of uh, the drainage system for, um, for the middle of town that was prepared in 2004, I believe. Um, it has largely been sitting on a shelf uh, since then uh, because there hasn't been a reason to focus on it. And the DPW is bringing forward, forward an article to update that study and get started on designing some of its key recommendations so that they can hopefully be built in the next couple of years. And that's, that's a great example of the kind of infrastructure upgrades that cities and towns need to be thinking of um, to get ready for climate change. In the spring, uh, town meeting should be looking at a new um, stormwater bylaw to um, better regulate the stormwater that's generated when sites are developed or redeveloped. That's another really important opportunity for Town to think about how do we need to uh, design and build the town in many, over the course of many years to come so that it is more flood resilient <clears throat> in the future. And then the last thing that, that may or may not uh, be coming up for the town is the town has um, embarked on a study of something called a stormwater utility which is a approach to funding stormwater infrastructure that we strongly encourage all of our municipalities to consider. 
you know, stormwater infrastructure is sort of the poor sister of, um, you know, drinking water and sewer infrastructure. Drinking water and sewer infrastructure, as I'm sure everybody here knows, are funded through sewer and water fees. Um, it's a funding mechanism that's very predictable, allows the DPW to really know how much money they have coming in and to be able to plan and make long-term investments. In most communities, uh, stormwater infrastructure is just a loose line item in the, in the budget, competing with everything else from schools to cemetery to whatever you have. And um, that's historically has been a recipe for municipalities to neglect this infrastructure until they get hit with a big incident. A stormwater utility is an approach to, it's a fee-based approach to funding stormwater, where essentially instead of using tax money to fund stormwater infrastructure, you would establish a fee based on the amount of pavement that each parcel of land has. And it provides a much steadier, more consistent, more reliable way to, to fund and to plan the improvements that are gonna be needed in the town's um, system. So the town is just now just starting to study the possibility of that. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot more conversation about it in town, but it's it's definitely something we encourage towns to think about. The town of Milton did this a couple of years ago, and we've already seen them um, be able to do a lot of good work because they have access to this, um, this reliable funding source for their stormwater system. So and last but not least, I'd just like to end um, with a picture of a young person. This person this is actually an old picture. This person is probably 20 now. It's the, the daughter of one of our, our board members. But um, I do think as we think about climate issues, one of the most important things we need to bear in mind is there's a generational equity issue um, about the choices we make now, perhaps more than ever before in human history, I mean, it sounds dramatic to say that, but it's true, are going to affect the ability of our children and our grandchildren to, um, to live a, a prosperous and healthy life. And I think, you know, it's really, the time has really come for society to uh, prioritize dealing with some of these issues. So thank you very much. That's, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to, um, to answer questions. You know, if, if folks in the audience, folks in the audience are, are welcome to, to follow up if we don't have time to get to all the questions tonight. Um, you know, the Watershed Association is an organization that works with lots of volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering, finding out more about uh, what we do and how you can help, uh, I encourage you to consider visiting our website, which is simply naponset.org. Uh, you can sign up for our free newsletter that'll keep you in the loop of uh, what's going on. We'd love to have you as a volunteer. We'd love to have you as a member. Um, it's very much a, a grassroots affair. So thank you. And if folks have questions, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to hang around and answer. Okay, thanks very much, Ian. I'm gonna go ahead and um, give everybody the capability of unmuting themselves. So um, if you'd like to ask a, a question over the microphone, go ahead. Otherwise, you definitely feel free to uh, chat it out there. Uh, would you please tell us again uh, how, what URL or whatever we can give friends and town meeting members we know and so forth so that they can then watch this presentation we just had. You gave it at the beginning, but I didn't get it written down and others may not have as well. Do you know the answer to that, Liz? The URL for for your organization? For no, for, for where they can watch this video. Ah, um, that's going to be put up by Norwood Community Media. Um, Norwood Community Media does have their own website and I believe YouTube channel, and I believe they're also going to be putting it on the actual TV cable channel. So if you know somebody likes to tune in on the tube, they can do that. Okay, thank you. 
I just had a, a guess a basic history question. How long has the Neponset River Watershed Association been uh, been working? We have been around for a long time. We were incorporated in um, in 1967. Um, and, we, and we've actually been around since it, at least 1963, as far as I can tell. And it, it really, we were founded actually by um, members of the conservation commissions of many of the towns in the watershed, including some people may know um, Betty Cottrell, who was a, was a longtime member of um, the Norwood Conservation Commission, was, was actually the secretary of the Watershed Association for many, many years, we, we still have her, her perfectly typed mimeographed minutes that she, uh, she kept in the 60s and 70s. And can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the dam removal in Norwood um, off of uh, Semna Street? Yes, so one of the projects we've been working on in Norwood is um, to remove the Mill Pond Dam, which is off of Sumner Street in, um, and or we're near Peswick Park, if anybody's ever been over there, sort of behind Route 1 and behind, um, kind of near the, the Walpole Mall. Um, and this is a small pond that was uh, likely built as a, a ice pond or just a recreational pond that's on Traphole Brook. And Traphole Brook is um, without a doubt the best trout stream uh, remaining in Eastern Massachusetts. It's really quite, um, quite amazing how robust it is when the, the last time the state went out there and did their uh, electro fishing to, to document the trout habitat, they, uh, they found 118 fish and every single one of them was a trout. Um, so the pond has, over the years, it has silted in, it's only about a foot deep now, and it has a small dam, which is in very poor condition and is likely I'm to gonna fail throw this away. In, in the next flood. And, um, so we've worked with the neighbors and the Conservation Commission and the, the DPW, and we're bringing forward a proposal. We're actually going through permitting right now to remove that dam and restore the stream. And that'll have a couple, aside from, from preventing it from failing during a flood and making the flood worse, it'll help to keep the brook cool by allowing there to be more shade over the brook by avoiding the current situation where the water sort of spreads out and just sits in the pond and, and bakes in the sun. Um, and also by allowing the fish to move more freely upstream and downstream, which is really a, a critical consideration for the survival of, of many forms of aquatic life, but certainly for trout. You know, as we face um, more drought issues, more flood issues, the fish need to be able to move around to find appropriate refuge areas so that they can uh, weather the storm. When they're trapped in a short stretch of stream, it's very hard for them to survive. So we're, we're hoping that uh, we'll have permits in hand for that uh, in the spring, uh, and we'll be seeking, uh, filing some grant applications, uh, hopefully in the late spring. And if we're lucky, we will be uh, doing a construction project there uh, next fall. Thank you. I think it's also important to note the, the work that the Trails Committee in town is doing to um, uh, install a trail along the, the restored stream area uh, through that park. It's a good hand in, hand in hand project. Yes, definitely recreational benefits are definitely part of the package there. I had a question about the, um, the stormwater infrastructure funding. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell me how have you seen that done and um, how, how frequently is it done? I, I love the idea. I'd love to hear more about general practice. Sure. So it's, you know, this and, and what we call this, we usually refer to this as a stormwater utility or sometimes we refer to it as a stormwater enterprise fund. But basically the idea is you, you know, we now have um, sufficient electronic mapping capabilities in the town and, and across the entire state now to be able to uh, to map you know each each individual parcel in the town and to be able to identify how much of that parcel is so-called impervious surface so pavement or uh, rooftop or other surfaces that that don't absorb water and then you can uh, structure a fee system 
that makes uh, the uh, fee for maintaining the stormwater system in proportion to the amount of pavement that each uh, parcel is contributing to the system. And, and there's, there's various ways to structure it. Oftentimes um, for simplicity, you know, where there's lots of very small residential parcels in a town, the town will use sort of a, a basic kind of average rate for, for small individual residential parcels. And then we'll charge a rate, you know, this is the same effective rate, but charge a rate for other kinds of parcels like commercial properties that, that may have a lot of pavement or may just have a little um, based on the actual amount of pavement just to, to simplify the administration. Um, and then it, you know, it, it gets added on to a water bill or, or a sewer bill or some, some places they send it as a separate bill. Um, and it, the money collected all goes into an enterprise fund that can only be used to pay for um, the stormwater infrastructure. So it gives you, aside from, um, you know, a different kind of revenue source, it gives you very strong uh, accountability and budgeting capability um, around that. And, and in most communities, um, the, uh, the selectmen, serve as stormwater commissioners and set the rates and then the budget uh, for the enterprise fund gets set uh, at town meeting each year. It, it really works very much like water and sewer fees in most towns. And in the Neponset watershed, the only town that has implemented this so far is the town of uh, Milton. Um, but there are about, I think it's up to like 15 or 18 cities and towns in Massachusetts that have done this. So Braintree does this, uh, Northampton, Reading, Newton. Um, and I, I know there's others that I just can't think of at the moment. So it, it's becoming a more and more uh, popular practice as communities are realizing, you know, we really do need to have more consistent investment in our, in our stormwater infrastructure. And this is a, both a fairer and more transparent and more predictable way to uh to collect that revenue and it's an idea that it's it's really an idea that started in other parts of the country there's something like 4500 stormwater utilities across the country as a whole it's it's much more common than other parts of the country great and sorry just one last question about that um the the what you've seen in other places or maybe what they're doing in milton is it um square footage of actual um you know, unpermeated surface, or is it as a percentage of the parcel? Uh, it's it's generally square footage. So when you're setting the rates, really the kind of math behind setting the rates is you say, okay, what's the total amount of pavement in the entire town? You know, there's 10 zillion square feet of pavement. And you say, okay, how much is our budget for the stormwater program this year, just for the sake of argument, say it's half a million dollars or a million dollars. And you basically divide um, a million by how many ever square feet of pavement you have to figure out what, what's effectively the rate per square foot of pavement. Um, and and then, the, then the question becomes, how exactly does the town set it up? You know, because it is you know, Milton, I think when we did this exercise with Milton, they have either five or 7,000 parcels and they, they didn't want to have to get into, you know, debating with every single homeowner. Well, do you have, you know, a hundred square feet of pavement or 101 square feet? So for residential properties, what they did, which was most of their parcels, they sort of grouped them into, um, to four tiers. So they said, okay, we'll, we'll, We'll see how much we, we can actually see on a spreadsheet how much pavement every single person every single home has uh, on their parcel across the whole town and they said okay we'll take the the lowest 25 percent has an average of i don't know what the right answer is but a thousand square feet and then the the peep the sizes from 25 percent to 50 percent have 1500 square feet and the next block has x hundred square feet so rather than trying to charge every single person their exact square footage they sort of put them into a group and say we're going to charge you the average for you know are you small medium or large essentially um, but but the underlying fee is still based on that that same rate 
And then when it comes to commercial properties or other properties that tend to have more pavement or that tend to be more variable in terms of how much pavement they have in Milton, they essentially do it just by the actual square feet. I think for Milton, they have maybe a thousand parcels or 500 parcels that are just sort of not simple homes. So it greatly simplifies the administration to do it that way. Thank you so much for that. Ian, we actually have a question in the chat. I'm gonna read it aloud as well, but if you want to read along, you can. Um, I've been reading about sustainable agriculture and how using compost and not weed killers can help improve the health of the soil, making it more spongy and able to hold more water. Do you think doing something like that in Norwood would help protect us a bit from future floods? I definitely think it would. You know, it's, it's interesting. For some reason in Massachusetts, um, you don't hear a lot about uh, this kind of soil management and soil health as a stormwater management practice. You know, a lot of people think, oh, my lawn isn't paved, you know, all the water soaks in. And, and in fact, most lawns are, are really quite compacted. Um, and there is actually a fair amount of runoff that will, will come off of a lawn, depending on how things are sloped. Um, and in other parts of the country, particularly the um, down in the sort of mid-Atlantic and the Chesapeake area, you do hear them talking about uh, quote unquote soil amendments for lawns to make them more porous and to give them more water retaining um, ability as a kind of recognized stormwater management practice. Um, for some reason, and maybe just because the state has not written that into our uh, state stormwater handbook, you don't hear a lot about that, but it's definitely a legitimate thing to do that, that can be quite helpful. And another chat question. Um, how will our town meeting members get the information they need to make informed votes on these issues coming up this fall? That is an excellent question. I and and honestly, I I don't know. Um, the 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 all of the issues I mentioned, the only one that is immediately coming up, as I understand it, for this fall town meeting is the, um, the updating the 2004 uh, so-called Meadowbrook drainage study, which really covers the center of town. Um, so that's a pretty straightforward um, expenditure. I don't think it's, it's it, and it, I don't think it's an enormous expenditure either. Um, so I imagine the, the finance committee or your warrant committee is certainly gonna be looking at that. And, and I imagine you will get information about it um, through the normal town meeting process. Uh, the stormwater bylaw and, and the possibility, and we don't even know if the town will decide they want to bring this forward, but the possibility of a stormwater utility in the spring are both things that are obviously going to need more discussion. And I would expect um, for the stormwater bylaw, I, I would guess, although I don't know, that um, it looks like the planning board is going to be the entity bringing that forward. And I would expect they would probably have some um, some of their own public meetings talking about that, giving people a chance to have some input into the design of it. And then the stormwater utility, uh, if the town does decide they wanna move forward with that, I expect they are gonna have um, a lot of conversation about it before it, it gets implemented, probably with some dedicated meetings. I don't know if that will be the selectmen bringing that forward or if, if it'll be the planning board or another board, um, but generally, that's, you know, that's, you know, creating a new fee is, is a big uh, process. Um, and most towns will, will make a pretty diligent effort to get people to have input into something like that. I think we have a couple of town meeting members on the call tonight. I don't know if anybody else has um, more information about how information was distributed for the spring town meeting, but I imagine it might be along similar lines again for the fall. Uh, Susan says that uh, she imagines it's time to contact our town meeting members on a personal one-to-one -one basis and invite them to view this video. Good idea. That will prepare them to examine the topic before it comes up in town meeting. Yes. Definitely share the word far and wide if you know anybody who might be interested or um, who, who does have a say at town meeting because this apparently is an issue that is coming up on the docket. 
The video will be shared on the library's YouTube channel as well as Norwood Community Media. Um, we are over the hour mark. So if anybody has any final questions, now is your time to ask. We will release Ian. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, thank you very much. This was excellent. And thanks everybody for taking time out of your evening to join us.